Hi, I'm Kevin Lee with the eMarketing Association. My day job's running Did It, uh, which I've been doing for 26 years. Uh, we're still heavily in search. Uh, we do a lot of SEM, a lot of SEO, uh, but now we do social, programmatic, pretty much everything. We made 11 acquisitions, so we're full service now. Um, I also run a nonprofit called Giving Forward in the Cause Marketing Space. And then I spend about an hour a week doing eMarketing Association interviews, of which this is one. I've got the pleasure of being with uh, Harry Cargman today, uh, who started Cargo almost 19 years ago. So you've been at this a long time as long well. Time. <laughs> I think I'm so the grandfather of the mobile marketing space. Exactly. I look like it. I get a little gray hair coming in, but I'm <laughs> definitely doing this longer than most. Right. Well, g given the fact that uh, not a lot of folks who may be watching this have been uh, knew you then when you started the company, they may not know the origin story. So why don't you give us the elevator pitch of the origin story? Sure. So, you know, I always knew that mobile was going to be incredibly important to our future. You have to remember to sort of set the stage. At the time, the phone itself was a flip phone. It was like the Nokia device. Uh, I think it was Ericsson. There was a Sony Ericsson collaboration. Um, there was a Qualcomm devices. I think there were a bunch of devices from China. Apple was not in this business and Google was not in the business. So if you remember, it was like your handy dandy flip phone. And when I started in 1999, the promise was that the phones which were used for making telephone calls would actually have text messaging and browsers eventually one day on them. So I was like, that's going to be the day. That's the remote control to your life. And so the origin of Cargo was building software and services for operators because I thought I could be the Yahoo for the homepage deck of the operator. That didn't go so well. I mean, we got a couple of deals done, but we realized that it would take forever to get the operator contracts done to, be, to sell software, especially for an area that they were not that interested in. We made so much money from voice uh, and selling data that the idea of providing value-added services was a nice to have as a, as, a, as a great thing for customers, but it wasn't their core business. Um, and so we took that and we sort of morphed the business into working with um, music companies and publishers. And in doing that, we became sort of the biggest provider of ringtones images, one of the biggest providers of ringtones images when that was sort of hot and then took all of that money, realizing that one day that would probably come to an end and um, invested in building out the sites for major media companies and publishers uh, with the idea that we would monetize not using advertising, but actually subscriptions on the cell phone. And then iPhone came out in 2007. Remember this is a full uh, eight years after I started the company. Uh, and we sort of realized in 2008, 2009 that the, the stranglehold that the operators had uh, on the market and controlling um, microtransactions and payments, uh, that would all come to an end uh, with both Google and Apple getting into the space. Um, and that the only real revenue stream for publishers would be that of advertising and then morphed again. So this is probably the fifth pivot I'm on, I've been on. And we've been on this pivot for the better part, let's say since 2011. Uh, so 10 years just on this, um, but the company has been you know, a labor of love and we've been able to grow it from myself and a handful of folks to, uh, to you know, well over 200 folks and we'll be a lot larger than that, um, you know, very shortly. Great, well, congrats. Now, where was the Palm Pilot when you started? Was that dead already or was that still alive? No, no the Palm Pilot wasn't even invented at the time. It was, <laughs> uh, you know, at the time, I think it was Apple had a script device uh, I don't actually think it was Apple. I think it was another Steve Jobs company. It was like you had uh, Next Computer and then you had, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it was it was the predecessor of the Palm Pilot. Not the uh, Newton. That wasn't the, the Newton. Apple Newton. Was the, it was, I don't think it was the Newton. I, it began with a Q. It's going to come to me, but I, <laughs> I know that there was, uh, it was, this was the predecessor to the Palm Pilot. Then that failed, then the Palm Pilot came in. That was sort of successful. And there were, if you remember, there were companies like Vindigo that was just built only for the Palm Pilot. And then the Palm Pilot sort of went away with the smartphone and you know, the rest is history.
Yeah, well, I, I beamed my card to people with my Palm Pilot. There was a time when that was how you would uh, send the person your business card. <laughs> I think um, I think there was a lot of actually super interesting services for the Palm Pilot that somehow have disappeared. And uh, what I've realized in the in the past twenty years doing this is that what's old is what's new again. So I think if you go back and brush off a lot of those business models and and concepts that worked really well, we've lost them a little bit, but I bet they can be like re-engineered into something even better today. Absolutely. Well, now that now that it's all about advertising and 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 you know connecting the consumer to the marketer, you know, via the publisher, and I assume that's both uh, sort of web publishers and app publishers in your case, right? So, you know, uh, more web than app, believe it or not. What's that? More web than app. Interesting. Okay, Always well, had difficulties with in-app advertising for a whole host of reasons, which we can get into. But um, we sort of always believed in the open internet, um, and the focus was always on sort of the most premium publishers and and providing something that was non-standard and non non-standard formats that would drive intent, that would drive recall. Um, so our focus was really how do we transform the advertising experience for the consumer, uh, the right data, the right publishers. Um, and the right creative um, that in combination would sort of deliver a knockout experience for advertisers um, and for consumers to get them to pay attention and to, uh, and to take an action. And if we, did, we could do that better than everybody, uh, hopefully um, advertisers would see the value in it and move the money to us. And if we could do that for publishers and really sort of give a better ad experience, it, makes the publisher experience better because they don't have schlocky advertising. It's respectful of the consumer experience because what we create really is um, respectful of that consumer experience. It's much more beautiful, it's much more impactful. Um, so the idea is to create these formats and experiences that really shock the consumer with something that's beautiful, that feels like it's intimately integrated into the site. Um, and that gets people to say, oh, I." I haven't seen that before. Uh, and, and they sort of curiosity drives them to want to find out more. Cool. Well, obviously getting the right creative that will actually break through the clutter and, and uh, feel like it's relevant to the consumer is key. Uh, but obviously a lot of media agencies and, and the clients are also interested in, well, what kind of targeting levers am I going to have available? Right. And so uh, we, we've kicked the third party cookie can down the road or Google kicked it down the road. For another year, but it, you know, in the meantime, uh, everyone really wants to think about okay, what, what targeting levers do I have now, and what targeting levers can I expect to have, you know, in in two years, right? If the third party cookie goes away, so what are some underutilized targeting levers that that not enough of your advertisers are taking advantage of to get the right creative in front of the right audience? Yeah, I mean, so first off, you know, cookies really are are a moniker it's a it's a it's a it's a driver of i think first party audiences from most advertisers or first party audiences um, that they're looking for um, and but most advertisers don't have data cpg doesn't have any data so they're like oh well, we want to use first party but we don't have our first party so we're going to use third party and we're going to buy these audiences and we're going to put together the right purchase path around strategies and audiences that they're looking to to find. Here's the challenge with that. And this just goes back and looks at the space, you know, going back. The example that I always give is when is the first moment that you move from a single or a bachelor or, you know, a, a single woman, they get married and they have a kid. When is that signal mass available on mass using cookies to, to identify that that couple now has their first either kid on the way or they have their first child and they're ready to buy Huggies, they're ready to buy Similac, they're ready to buy pacifiers, they're ready to buy their new Volvo automobile, they're going to have to move and buy bear paint, um, they're going to have to go to the Home Depot. I mean, if you think about it, you've, you've created a sort of this life moment where a lot of things change and there's all these purchases that set that couple up for success. The challenge is to get a credit card swipe somewhere where the data is actually available to go into the ads ecosystem can be challenging. 
Walmart doesn't really share with the ads ecosystem. Target doesn't really share with the ads ecosystem. So it's that first time that they don't are not buying their diapers from Walmart and Target and they're sort of on vacation and they run out and they need to swipe it at pick your place, convenient grocery store. Maybe it's a small uh, pharmacy chain. Maybe it's CVS if they happen to share the data, which I'm not convinced of. And you run into this question of, is the data only then available to the larger ecosystem to put that man and that phone, think of it as phones or computers into the new parent segment three to five months after they actually have the kit. Whereas if you're browsing for articles on how to be your best, you know, new dad or what to do when you're expecting mom's edition, you could actually probably get a much better signal on changes in life course from some of the content and search that people are looking for that doesn't necessarily get syndicated through the ecosystem. And so I think um, I think there's a lot of value to some of the contextual signals that frankly, nobody's really been using to date. And the reason they haven't been using it is everybody's been so obsessed with that one-to-one marketing that they rather the precision of being, of joining this new new parent segment than taking a little bit of a broader understanding of the marketplace and using these contextual signals of reading habits of the consumer to basically make some guesswork as to whether this couple is entering that new segment or not. And so I think in answer to your question, contextual signals uh, you know, related to uh, moving, if you see the device has moved from this location to that location, change of job, there are, there are lots of these signals that are available to you that are not solely based on the cookie or buying third-party audience segments that are available to the publishers that I think we've always had, but frankly, without this sea shift toward privacy and marketers actually thinking about, okay, what am I doing to replace that of our cookie targeting strategies? All these things that were at their benefit all these years now actually get to be dusted off and hopefully in some cases are even more effective than putting all the eggs in the cookie basket. Yeah, well, absolutely. You and I are both uh, old enough to have seen AdSense launch, right? So AdSense was purely contextual in the beginning. There was no behavior, right? So it was keyword driven and having been a, a search marketing platform at the time, right? You know, we were very early adopters of, of what is now the GDN, but you know, the, it was originally uh, powered by AdSense, which, which was purely contextual, right? And so almost everything was keyword driven. And uh, you know, this is long before Blue, Cl- Blue Kai and Exalate went into the behavioral side, right? right. And said, oh no, Oracle we can- and all the rest, yeah. yeah <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, to your earlier point, right? What's old is new again. It really is back to the future, right? It is, but I think, you know, what shouldn't be lost um, to people is we can be much more precise. The data science, the ability to store data, the ability to slice and dice that data, um, the ability to build micro cohorts, the ability for publishers to share that data. Um, there is a whole new world that would never have been able to be tapped um, back even five to 10 years ago. The level of, of capability now, the, the teraflops of data that you can collect, and the ability to build and write new algorithms, and even the base of the data science that you get to build off of, it's a completely different set of platforms that you can build, even if it's off of contextual signals. It is not what we experienced 10 years ago or even five years ago. You know, companies like Snowflakes and Kubernetes and, and others that are sort of building these incredible distributed data capabilities allow you to basically um, do things uh, and build algorithms and collect data and slice and dice that data, unlike what we would have been able to do with machine learning and, and the algorithms, you know, previously. So I think, I think the efficacy of what we're talking about and how you can build things that will actually be effective is significantly better um, than just thinking that we're going to be knocked back 
you know, 10 years and it's going to be the same level of capabilities that we had then. Absolutely not. Totally transformative since then. Yeah, well, that's that's great to hear. I mean, I, one of the things that we had to sort of hack to get it to work the way we wanted was different contextual signals had different uh, recency uh, effectiveness, right? So some would indicate you were in market for a very short period of time uh, and others like, you know, would be longer period, right? So a person doing research on a honeymoon is in market for a while or mortgage is in market for a while, contextual signals, right? Uh, whereas some things that they were looking at, maybe a golf driver, maybe they'd be in market for a week, right? Comparatively right. speaking. And so we had to sort of hack our cookie lengths uh, with our targeting in order to do that. It seems like a lot of the new platforms are starting to become more intelligent about that and know sort of, you know, uh, put people in the bucket for uh, the right period of time. Exploration of data is not something that we've actually, and in fact, I would say it's even worse with cookies. People believe that their segments and the targeting of cookies is everlasting. You know, like the, the people that you're targeting from four years ago, they're like, well, it worked then, should work now. Nobody's, they haven't changed. But, you know, obviously I'm not at age, you know, 46 buying the same kinds of things that I'm probably was buying when I'm 36. Just I'm at a different point in my life, right? I, I can't fit into those shorts, those swim trunks anymore. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there's a, a, a question, although there's goals, there's a question of, um, of really the validity and expiration time of a lot of the segments. And I don't know, honestly, that the world looked at things with that level of, uh, called specificity. There wasn't that time to live on data. People valued their data and their database as if it was evergreen and everlasting. They didn't realize that it probably churns every six months, you know, or even less. And so like the value of something collected six months ago is probably not that valuable. That, that sort of, um, uh, for lack of a better term, thinking of it as a half-life, you know, on data, you know, and every, every year that goes by, the value of that data, you know, shrinks by that much. I think um, I think that concept of data exploration uh, hasn't, uh, you know, I'm hoping that with this new renaissance around targeting strategies, um, that concept of exploration around data and the, the preciousness of data, people would be like, I can never share that. And be like, dude, you share, you know, like that, that data is useless six months from now. Got to share it now. <laughs> Can't share it in six months. Yeah, absolutely. So this data should probably live in more than one place, right? A bigger publisher will probably want to have its own repository of this data and be able to use it for its own, you know, efforts and share it with the ad ecosystem. But some smaller to mid-sized publishers may not be able to, you know, aggregate this data. So, so where should it live? Where are the various places this, that this data should live so that? so that the broader ad ecosystem can take advantage of it. So I think, you know, our approach is that there is no perfection around targeting. There is only test and learn. So from my perspective, there's third-party data that will live at, let's say, a live ramp or an Oracle or a new star. And that should be one data layer of a campaign. Publishers will have their own private marketplace deals where they're going to be able to layer their own contextual first-party signals on top that should be a, level, a different level of the same campaign. And so campaign should actually have multi layers. It should be like a cheesecake with multiple or those, you know, those lady M cakes that have multiple layers of crepes. Every, there should be at least three, four, five different targeting layers on every campaign that you're trying to launch, all trying to achieve the same outcome. So you're using a contextual set of signals to achieve the same outcome you're using cookie-based signals, and the idea is if you get enough of these layers, then you'll achieve scale. And the hope is that each of these layers will fill in a different part of the market that the other set of targeting wouldn't necessarily pick up on, but all of it equally valid. So if you have super highly valued cookies, but it only works on Android devices, that's great. That's a great targeting layer, at least kick, kicking the can down the road. And then, but that leaves out all your iPhone users who already are in ITP 
2.0, probably even beyond 2.5 now with all the changes that Apple's making. But to say I'm just going to launch a Android-oriented cookie campaign is a huge miss. So you need to have that right alternative set of targeting targeted against Apple audiences, both iPhone and Safari on computer, because there's such a large group segment of known customers and valued customers that happen to not own an Android device, for example, that you need to have that simultaneous alternative targeting strategy running concurrently to that cookie strategy. And the idea is to build that layer cake uh, with any campaign that you run. It can't be one size fits all. It has to be thoughtful, built upon itself. You could say, this one is my first valued layer of strategy or targeting. This is second, third, fourth, fifth, and you build you know, at least four or five different layers in a single campaign, and therefore you'll achieve scale. You'll be multi-device. Uh, you'll be multi-mechanism or multi-strategy driven in terms of finding those right audiences. And you'll, you'll probably get a much better outcome or result because of these overlapping strategies running simultaneously. That's uh, definitely great advice. Um, a, a related question to that is, is certainly if you're either in a niche or your consumers only in market for a brief period of time, or maybe every several years is, is in market for a brief period of time, you know, you're always making a trade-off between level of targeting and scale, right? And so, you know, how do you recommend people go through that thought process of, okay, I'll, uh, I can get more scale if I, if I perhaps layer into some additional targeting, which isn't quite as accurate as the targeting I'm used to, but I do need the extra scale. And so, you know, when, when do you add that next layer? When do, and make well, that? Well, that's, and that's exactly what I was describing is the waterfall. So basically how far down the waterfall, this is your hyper-focused, super, you know, super, super thin layer. You say, wow, whenever I find somebody on that, I got to hit them. And then you have your second layer in the layer cake and the third layer. And your spend will dictate how far down those layers you need to go to hit the scale of audience you're trying to achieve to hit the results that you want. So if it's a super short, but you know, very important campaign that you're trying to launch, then on those five layers or four layers, you'll be like, I need to exhaust that spend in a very short period of time. Maybe you're willing to go a little bit deeper down that that layer cake because of the timing constraint. If you have more time, maybe you stay a little bit shallower and you sort of spend a lot more money here at the very thinnest layer, but then you dip into these other strategies to look for efficacy. But your entire strategy should be, I have these four or five layers running simultaneously and you're figuring out allocations of spend between those four or five layers to try to reach the, the, the scale and reach that you need to be able to hit your targets. Right, right. Uh, moving to one of your other elements of secret sauce, which is just creative, right? That breaks through. Um, the most um, undervalued, but most powerful. Yeah. So, so I, and I agree 100%. It's almost a renaissance of creative the, driven by auction-based media, because if you can't afford the media because your creative sucks, then you're out of the game, right? So, <laughs> um, but uh, as it relates to... Uh, you know, mobile devices that there, there are all sorts of people that use create use their mobile devices at different levels. Some people are on them 24 hours a day. Other people just hop in and out. And so you, you you'll within certain segments of your audience, you may start to see creative burnout, but you may not see it across the entire campaign. So, you know, how do you guys recommend that people think about creative burnout? Like, should should they always be playing king of the hill, where I just always have my next creative queued up? ready to try to outperform my last creative? Yeah, but I think first off, the mistake that we make and you see it on TV is you run the same ad over and over. I do think there's value to frequency. You know, uh, a very famous uh, creative ad exec said, if you don't put something in front of somebody at least three times, it doesn't sink in. It doesn't sink into the subconscious. So you gotta get a certain level of frequency in front of consumers at least three times for them to take any notice at all. But that being said, there's certain ads that you see around the Olympics, if you remember, there was like five or six key sponsors where you're like, oh my God, if I see this ad again, I'm gonna kill myself. So I do think that a diversity of 
similar messaging for the same product, but done differently across different creatives. So you're getting at it from different angles. It's very, very powerful. And I think that digital really allows you to do that. It allows you to follow up a few times with the same consumer, especially on a first party basis, based on the publisher, where you can actually have some kind of uh, sequential messaging uh, around the same product, but you do so where you're giving something that is slightly new, slightly different to that same consumer over and over again, so that they're not bored, they see something new and they don't get exhausted from the same you know, recurring message. So from my perspective, building a few different creatives, A, B testing them and not, and saying, listen, I'm gonna frequency cap the creatives at a certain number, but then I wanna keep on hitting them so that they can actually convert. So I've gotta sort of, you know, diversify or alter the messaging between a couple different, a few different creatives so that it's different at least once out of every three or four times, I think is, uh, I think is very powerful. And I don't know that we're doing that as an industry well today, but I certainly think the capabilities are there to do it well. And it's certainly something that we're suggesting is very powerful. Um, but if you have the right scale of budget uh, and you sort of know where you wanna show up, having that diversity of creative and some kind of sequential targeting to it, I think could be extraordinarily effective. So you mentioned scale of budget there, and obviously the, the bigger the budget, the lower as a percentage of that media budget, the creative costs will be, right? But once you start to get into a more niche advertiser, uh, and if their budget's not quite as big, they may not have the ability to, to invest. So there's the lots way. of amazing tools. We, we uh, have built a super simple WYSIWYG self-service tool. Um, there's other tools coming out, you know, wait till we launch self-service where you can't afford the white glove, you know, third-party designer or creative agency. If you're really good on Instagram or if you can hire a freelance designer and use some of the tools that are out there, I think you can create a pretty amazing creative experience. Um, some of the most innovative experiences are done by influencers and they only have themselves. So figuring out how to develop using the tools that are out there, something that really speaks uh, authentically about your brand and mission, uh, using your own photography and being able to put that into a platform that will sort of self-assemble that to something that looks professional. All of those tools are out there and we're certainly going to be providing more and more of those tools to um, smaller and medium-sized businesses that are looking for um, for more. What we found is the largest advertisers want the expertise with somebody holding their hand to go and build this. But many small advertisers are like, listen, I don't need that handholding. I don't need that extra creative capability from an agency that's going to cost me a lot of money. Just give me the tools and the capabilities and I'll figure it out my, on my own. And I think as long as we can provide those tools and capabilities, why not have at it? do all the planning yourself, that nimbleness of being a smaller brand actually allows you to do more from a creative perspective, more A-B testing than many larger brands where a lot of that decision-making process has been distributed. Are a lot of the publishers uh, looking to uh, approve ads on a case-by-case -case basis? Or Absolutely do they not. They approve formats on a case-by-case -case basis. And they, and they approve content categories. So maybe they don't want alcohol. Maybe they don't want, um, you know, marijuana or HTC, um, you know, cannabis. Maybe they don't want um, certain types of prescription medications. Um, but certainly beyond those categories, um, so long as you're in a category that fits and you have a format that has been approved, the idea is to provide a self-service platform that allows you to quickly and easily produce, you know, based upon those two limitations, um, campaigns and get them up and running and, and drive that, that fill to the advertisers who's looking to maximize their revenue from the ad slots that they have. So uh, obviously there are probably a bunch of folks going to watch this who are going to say, you know, when's that coming out? It seems like it's something in your roadmap. It's, you may have a general uh, target launch date 
Can you we share that? We have customers using it today, but we have not opened it up to a broader set of audiences. Uh, hopefully that will happen uh, sometime during the fall. Great. Well, uh, I look forward to, to watching that, that evolve. There's certainly a, a lot of mid-size uh, marketers who are really chomping at the bit to, to get better tools. So, and better Yeah, and, and if you're the right size, mid-size customer, please reach out. I mean, we have it today. People are using it. We're scaling it. It's pretty awesome. Cool, cool. Uh, well, to tie things up, uh, you know, one of the things I've always admired about uh, you and the company is you, you've done social impact stuff, uh, nonprofit uh, work, I, volunteerism. So I'm, I'm curious whether the driver w w to that was sort of more personal on your own basis, or you saw it as a morale booster for the company. Like, what have been the the drivers for you guys to be so involved in the in the nonprofit and social impact community? I think. Um... I think for many of our employees, um, there has to be a mission that goes beyond just making money. And employees probably feel more loyal to the company and feel like they're making a difference by actually driving social good through our capabilities to reach consumers en masse. And so the fact that we have this amazing pulpit where we can talk to almost every American and many other people around the world every day and multiple times a day, and where we have the ability to break through and share the importance of different ad council campaigns as an example, get out the vote as another example, um, some of the causes around um, choice, um, some of the causes around hunger, some of the causes around environment. Um, these are subjects that many of our employees and me myself are driven by. And so to do all of this and not to leverage the capabilities that we have to actually make a difference in the world and to get people to pay attention um, really would be a failing of our responsibility. You don't build all of this capability and not use it for some level of good. You know, I'm very proud of what we did around um, COVID, um, both vaccinations, uh, health um, advisory, getting people to stay home um, at the height of the pandemic, um, you know, really letting people know what they need to do to stay safe, um, you know, locking down, using masks, washing hands uh, and providing sort of larger sets of uh, public service announcements around how to grapple with things like mental health. Um, even cheering on our first responders uh, and, and running a campaign to thank them. So much of that is so, so critical, I think to our civil, civil responsibilities, broadly speaking. Um, and so for us to be some advocate in that larger mission, knowing that we probably did some good, uh, given the scale that which we operate at, I think makes you just make the world a little bit of a better place. And so um, the best way to get back, I think, is to, to use the skill sets and the capabilities that you have today. Um, because giving money, that's great, but it doesn't actually do. Um, and we're capable at Cargo of, of doing and creating change. Great, well, thank you for doing that. And uh, thanks so much for, for joining me for this interview. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Kevin. Appreciate it.